the number one thing I think all organizations need to be very clear on is who are you trying to help? How are you trying to help them? And how will you know if you help them well, right? Clarity, just get clear because we we speak in jargon sometimes and we, like you said, we use vanity metrics to fill up spreadsheets. But like when you got your three to five numbers, you're trying to hit every month and you know exactly what work you're doing each quarter and each year to drive towards that three, five, 10 year goal, that vision, things get clear. And I think that is one thing I would hope we started the episode saying, what are we still excited about, right? I said, I was really excited that a lot of the, the thoughtful and useful ways that HubSpot was implemented artificial intelligence made it easy to use. And I feel like that's a good goal that we have as a company is make our stuff easy to use so we can get quicker time to value. And so, yeah, I'm just kind of hearing this theme of like simplicity, clarity across all aspects of your business. You're listening to RevOps Champions, a podcast created for B2B leaders to help you align your people, streamline your processes, trust your data, and leverage technology in order to grow your business. We're your hosts, Brendan Denewell, CEO and co-founder of Dynamico. And Amy Weaver, Dynamico's marketing director. So Mark, let's dive right in. I'm so excited to have you on the show today sort of the dust has settled from inbound, what are you still most excited about? Because, you know, the week after inbound, we were all like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. This is amazing. There's so much opportunity, so many awesome things for businesses to embrace as technology continues to evolve at a rapid rate. But now that the sort of the the dust has settled, what are you still most excited about since all the announcements at inbound? Wow. So wait, let's see. We're probably about like a minute and a half into the podcast. I'm already going to say AI, but don't leave yet, people. What I'm most excited about is the way that HubSpot specifically was able to create opportunities for AI to be leveraged within HubSpot just to make things easier for users. I think right now, a lot of people, you know, we're kind of in this traditional bell curve of adoption of innovation. And there are a lot of naysayers. There's a lot of, you know, worry around what is AI? What's it going to do? When we start to see that first initial wave of early adoption, I think that what we're looking for is what are the easy ways? What are the specific use cases that I can leverage AI where it just makes my job easier? And I think they did a really good job of talking to customers, also seeing like kind of where the world is going and what the opportunities are. And so when we talk about like Breeze Intelligence or things like Content Remix, these are adoptions and use cases of artificial intelligence that just make your life easier and they're easy to use. To me, that's probably what I'm most excited about is this stuff's just easy to use. Just talk to it, ask it, build me this report. It's done, right? It just, you talk to it and it's done. Yeah, yeah. And so we've done a few recordings of RevOps Champions since Inbound. And actually, I've had a couple of my partner friends on as well, which has been kind of fun. From an AI perspective, well, actually, let's go back to the big announcement, the new slogan of HubSpot, easy, fast, and unified. I absolutely love the unified part because I think unification is always going to be a good thing, at least when it comes to teams and technology. Mm-hmm. The the easy and, and fast part is, has has caused some heartburn for us as, as partners. Have you heard anything about that? Nothing's come across my way, but I feel like my conversations sometimes ebb and flow different ways. I see where there can be a little bit of heartburn on that, right? It makes sense. When you look at like the spectrum of like who's helping who, what they're helping them with and why they're helping them, the concept of easy and fast sometimes can be in opposition to deep and thoughtful work and really impactful work. So I think we tend to think as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as partners, that like we want to make sure we deliver the high value to our clients. We also want to make sure we're doing it thoughtfully. We want to make sure that we're doing right and being valuable to our partners. And so sometimes easy and fast, just by words of adjectives, are like easy and fast, that's going to be very disruptive. So I I can hear that for sure. I haven't heard much about it, but again, I I think you're probably having some different conversations than I am maybe. Yeah, no, it's just, and I think, you know, this is always the, the sort of the dance between software and the professional services firms who are responsible for customizing and implementing and optimizing that software for our clients, right? We always have to preface this by saying that, you know, HubSpot has has built, you know, the most incredible partner channel. You can look at pretty much any ecosystem, whether it's in the CRM space or, or elsewhere, it'll be hard to find a, a better partnership than what HubSpot has built with, with us as, as HubSpot solutions and app partners. 
However, obviously, ultimately, HubSpot is a software company that sells a product. And this is how it was positioned by Yamani and others at Inbound is, yes, HubSpot is easy, but you have to say, well, compared to what, right? It's And how it was positioned at Inbound is, yeah, it's easy compared to Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics or you name it. Any alternative, and that's a, a much longer list of criteria to, to consider, HubSpot is absolutely easy, easier, right? There's, there's just no doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that you just plug it in and it works, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's interesting. It's almost like when we were saying like easy and fast. It's like I, in my head, I start thinking about like what are some other things that are like really fast, but maybe you can't get up to speed so quickly. I think about like if you put me in front of like a sports car, I would have no idea how to drive it, how to get the most out of it. Like you need to learn, right? So I think whether it's the software and technology. I think that in order to really get the bang for the buck in the long run, the real value, right? The time to value is you got to do the the learning and the uncovering and the human part of it. You can't just drag and drop and put in technology and think things are better. I come from a world of like human-centered design, right? Where the first stage in anything, whether it's go-to-market strategy, new product development, corporate innovation, we always start with empathy. Who is the user? What are their challenges? What are their pains? So I think in the professional services category, if people continue to still lean into that, figuring out who are the customers, what are their pain points, what are their goals, their challenges, their consequences and implications of not meeting those challenges or goals, I feel then we start to say, okay, where within you know HubSpot, what things can we leverage? What solutions are there to help absolve you of those challenges, to help you reach those goals? I do fear that like, and I'm sure it happens with everything, but like when new announcements like this happen, the perception in some circles are like, you just drop it in and everything's good. You're like, no, that is not how this works, right? You can't just, yeah, like I always tell my kids, you can't buy a gym membership to get fit. Yes, exactly. Yeah, if you're eating McDonald's on your way into the gym, it ain't gonna work. And I think the same is true with technology. Starting first with like the use case, what are the challenges? What are we driving towards? And then figuring out where within all of these this new stuff that we you know revealed at Inbound, what makes the most sense to start leaning into? Because I what I don't think people should be doing is expecting that everything we released is going to be a game changer for them immediately. It's like, what are you working on right now? Maybe it makes sense to start with the landing page generator content remix or with Breeze AI and, and you know, Copilot, but only do it if it helps you do your job better and deliver more value to your customers. Be a human. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of this this confusion or, or heartburn comes from what we've learned over a long time and, and many mistakes and, and experiences with customers who didn't do things in the right order. It's fire, ready, aim kind of stuff. But ultimately, it's the old analogy of the, the shiny object syndrome, right? Because you know whether it's an iPhone or HubSpot, it is amazing technology which can lead certain people like myself to go, oh my God, I need to have that, that latest piece of technology and it's gonna solve all my problems, which of course, in the case of HubSpot, it, it will, but you still have to configure it and customize it specifically for your business to solve the issues or challenges or fill the gaps that you have in, in your specific business, which of course also then brings us to, to the fast, you know, when HubSpot says easy and fast, again, it is fast compared to Salesforce or Dynamics, because you can stand up and implement and, and potentially do some serious onboarding and training and change management on HubSpot, moving a, a company onto HubSpot or the HubSpot CRM in three to six months, which again is fast compared to the two or three years it's going to take to do it on, on Dynamics or Salesforce. So again, it is comparatively fast. And again, the time to value is absolutely there, but it's not, again, Three to six months of pain is is obviously better than two to three years of pain. But it, again, you still have to go through that change management. And you know whether you're a team of 10, 50, 100, 1,000, you're going to have to go through that change for three to six months. And in fact, I was actually chatting with one of our solution architects last week about this. And he was like, and in some cases, being easy and fast, and this is what causes the heartburn, is that you have to go through the change a lot faster. If you're implementing... Salesforce or or Dynamics, you have two to three years to sort of digest the changes because they get, they're happening you know more slowly and deliberately over time. And I had, I hadn't even thought about that, 
but it's true. So again, we have to do a lot more, a lot faster to get our HubSpot customers to that fast time to value. But again, it's a great challenge and one we're up for. But you know, we're just having to sort of realign how we need to sort of do our education on the marketing and sales side as we go to market. Okay, so two things that came up that I think are really interesting. One is you talked about the shiny object. I feel businesses should be human-centered, right? Who are their customers, their clients that they're trying to help grow and always be in service of that. That is your North Star, helping people grow. And if just because a shiny object comes along, it doesn't mean we have to jump on it. It doesn't mean we have to adjust course. The North Star is still the North Star. If the shiny object is in service of that, great. If not, my recommendation has always been for, I always tell people, if you own a business, you should be setting aside explicit time each week, each month, whatever, to put yourself out of business. Because if you're not, somebody else is, right? Just this idea, this comes from Pixar, right? Pixar, the great company, has this um, idea of like creative play. And that is where ideas come from. Jim Henson was a big creative leader. And again, was really lived in this world of creative play. We can adopt that mindset to help us grow business. And, And in kind of service of the shiny object, we don't have to readjust course immediately, but we should give it some attention and some love, some play time, right? Friday afternoon, three to four, we get together in a Zoom or in the office and we are just, what is this thing? Like, what is Content Remix? How quickly can it do? Does it really work? And by taking time to kind of maybe dull up the shiny object a little, give it a little bumps and bruises, scratch it a little bit, test it out. Poke some holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it demystifies it. It makes it less scary. It makes us more well-informed. Then we're, we have a much better understanding of the tool and the feature to say, I think this could help that one client with that one problem that they have, rather than saying, shiny object here for everyone. The other thing that you did say that was really interesting was with different softwares have different adoption cycles and different times and different timelines for adoption. And some of them take years, some of them could take months. I always like to think, Brendan, about the experience what is the experience for the person that we're trying to help? And you and I, we, we first met in Chicago, right? We were, there was like this dinner, this nice fancy dinner. Like, we sat down. It was like, it was a great dinner. Like I still, to this day, I still tell people like, I sat down next to this guy. I, I thought immediately, we're like, oh my God, we're gonna have this great conversation. We had an awesome conversation, right? Like It was really good. It was really good. It like started a friendship. But what's interesting is that dinner, that experience, right? You walk into this place, it's in a certain neighborhood, you kind of get this certain vibe, you look around, there's music. It's a different experience than if you and I went to like Mr. Beef and got an Italian beef and a Coke and we sit down on the curb and we, you know, unwrap the wax paper. So I think what's another thing that I think partners and people, whether they're, again, HubSpot Solutions partners, other software partner agencies, One thing we might want to think about is kind of flipping the filter to our clients around the experience, right? To say, we traditionally think of software adoptions as being these long, arduous, grueling things that have changed management and how we think about it. And there's new tech stack and there's training and there's a whole new, or we could say, or is this like the Mr. Beef where we're like, hey, what's the end goal? We eat, we're full, we're happy. You could be happy sitting on the curb eating Mr. Beef and fries you could also be happy eating a fancy steak dinner in the West Loop. So one thing that I I think could be helpful for partners as we talk with our clients is thinking about really identifying what is this experience? When we say, is it going to be long and arduous, but we're going to take our time, we're going to do it right, versus we have some things in place that are going to, going to allow us to move a little bit faster than we traditionally do. And although you might have gone through adoptions before and you've had this kind of long experience, this might be different. And maybe we should just call that out in the beginning so that that person, again, on the human side, who's on the other end of the Zoom, the phone call or in the office with you, if they get the sense that like, why are we going so fast? I feel like we're missing something. We often don't equate fast with value, right? We think about billable hours. We think about, you know, make sure we're, nothing's falling through the cracks, et cetera. But things are a little bit different now. So I think about maybe upfront setting the experience to say, hey, this is not an eight course dinner at a white tablecloth restaurant. This might be somewhere in between. And I think designing the experience for the client could really help kind of both the partner and the client. Really good insights, Mark. Really good insights. And actually, I, so I wanted to bring it back because, you know, ultimately, you know, what I discovered in that at that dinner where we met initially in, in Chicago, well, in fact, you even, and you even say this on your on your LinkedIn profile, it's, you know, helping people think differently and 
bring their ideas to life. It sounds like that's a kind of a, and obviously you can change that whenever you like, but that seems to be like a continuous thread in through your career. And you know, one of the things that I think about a lot as evolution is happening at a very fast pace right now, especially in the in the world that we live in. Again, you mentioned it, AI. I mean, up until a month ago, we talk a lot about data and technology on this show, in addition to process and people, because those are, those are kind of for us the four pillars that we need to align to successfully do what we do, or for our client to successfully do what we do. And you know, six months ago, obviously AI just started creeping into every conversation. And of course, now in the last month, well, first of all, you cannot talk about data or technology without talking about AI, because that's what AI is. AI is data and technology. And it's there to help support your processes and your people to make things better, faster, etc. But ultimately, I think I, I love what your recommendation so far, which is ultimately bring it back to who do you want to be a hero to or who are you a hero to in your business and really get super granular about what that looks like. The sort of Amazon Walmart comparison used to be a lot easier because they were very, very different companies. Now they seem actually really similar. Very similar. Yeah. But they still attract not as much as, you know, it used to be they used to attract completely different people. People who were attracted to go to Amazon were not the same people who were going to attract to work at, work at Walmart. Now there might be a lot of crossover. And in fact, there might be people moving between the two. So for all the, the CEOs or CXOs, leaders out there who are really responsible about reminding their teams about who it is that they're solving for and who it is that they're a hero to, whether you're selling a service or a product, it just seems to be so much more under a, sort of a lens right now but even if it isn't if you're if you i think back to your recommendation earlier about how you solve for for ai is it going to help us better solve for our customer to introduce certain elements of of ai or not right it's i think that was a really good recommendation anyway any any more thoughts on that on that piece of the link between solving for the customer in other words who do you want to be a hero to and potentially how you use data and technology to solve for that? A hundred percent, yes. So I think, again, you're kind of broken record, but go to the person, right? And let's not talk persona. Like nowadays with our data, if you've got good data, you can really personalize all of this. So go to the person that you're talking to. And, I, and first and foremost, there's two different types of people we're talking with, right? So if you're running a partner agency, I think about your internal people, we have to solve for them too, because they also have goals, challenges, problems, right? They're scared as well. What is this going to do for my job? Is, if I'm a marketer, and now I can take one piece of content, upload it to this content remix, and now I get 50 pieces of content. What does that do for me? What am I going to spend my time on? So there's these fears there as well. So I think we have to solve internally for our teams. We then also have to solve for the greater organization. And I just literally, it's probably like a scene from a bad business movie, but I was, I spoke at this conference last week and then they have like a little, you know, hangout afterwards. And I was just talking with some guy. I was like, so what are you up to, man? Like, what do you do? And he's telling me, oh, I run this, you know, this marketing agency and I'm just starting to step into this like CRO role. I'm like, oh, what's that like? Tell me more about that. And I was like, so like, what are the challenges for you? And he's like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to bring in business and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, let me give you unsolicited advice, right? And this is like the go-to. I love this framework. I actually learned it at HubSpot, but it's just the sales process, right? And it's very simple. It's this acronym and it starts with what are your goals as an organization? What are the challenges you have in reaching those goals? And what plans do you have for absolving yourself of those challenges in, in service of those goals? And even when people start to answer those questions, if they don't have an answer, you've already been valuable to them. Because if they don't have documented goals that are time bound and whether they're smart goals or whatever, immediately they're like, ooh, I don't have this documented. That's a red flag. And if you're not aware of what are the challenges in reaching your goal, if you haven't named them, I think you and I talked about like EOS. Yeah, we don't on EOS, yeah. Right. So folks listening, if, if you're like, don't know what EOS, it's the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a great framework and model for running your business. And one of the greatest things I feel about it, among others, is this idea of like an issues list, right? You keep a long running list of issues you have within your company. And that could be challenges. It could be innovations and ideas. It could be interpersonal problems. Like, hey, I didn't like the way, you know, so-and-so said this. Whatever. 
if we don't name our challenges, if we don't name our issues, they do two things. They eat away at us. They eat away at our minds and they eat away at our hearts. And so if we don't do this for our business, we don't know what problems we're trying to solve. All we're trying to do is make money. That's all they're trying to do. Versus how do we think about strategic growth? How do we expand into new markets? How do we find more people that need our help that don't know they need our help? So I think like the short part of that long-winded answer is find the people internally that you're solving for and then find people at the organizational level and figure out what are their goals, their challenges, and their plans to resolve themselves with challenges and figure out where the help can be. Nine times out of 10, there's gonna be some level of new technology or software or process improvement that we can use to change that. And I think that when we think about the data piece of it, Brendan, is we often say companies are data rich, but insight poor. So if we could have all this data and then we have a question we're trying to answer, we have a problem we're trying to solve, we've got an issue that we've identified, the data points will start to reveal themselves to where we can actually put some numbers, some objective numbers to this subjective challenge that we're having. So I think that's a big thing to think about is name it, own it, talk about it so you can help the people internally and at the organization level. Yeah, yeah, that's really good, Mark, thank you. So, and in fact, that it kind of brings up another learning that we've had in the last few weeks as we've been like diving into all the new AI functionality with yeah, specifically in Breeze, but then also obviously like everybody else, we're using GPT-40 and, and Claude and pretty much anything else we can get our hands on that we think will help us solve some of our issues, right? And issues is, is one of the few sort of misunderstood terms in, in EOS. Issues aren't necessarily always negative, even though the word issue sounds like a negative. Issues can often be opportunities because all it is is getting them on the that important part of the agenda where you can either ideate or solve or whatever that issue is. One of the things that we've noticed is with all these AI tools and as we have clients reaching out to us or businesses reaching out to us to say, well, how do we incorporate all this HubSpot AI functionality into what we're doing? How do we prioritize it, et cetera? It became very apparent very quickly that until you have good, clean data, there's nothing else to do. We've had multiple people on the, on the team sort of starting to play around with the different Breeze tools just for ourselves internally at Dynamico. And that actually should have shone the spotlight on a few areas where, oh, actually, you know, we don't have that set up correctly. We don't have, you know, the right object or record or it's not set up. So the great thing is we can now go back and fix that. But until it's fixed, we're not going to get accurate data, which means that if we're asking Breeze or whatever AI tool to help us and it's not working with accurate data, it's actually not going to help us, in, in which case don't even get started until you're working with clean data. Yeah, that I think is a huge thing for folks, right? If you put them on a scale around like AI technology versus the change management of getting your data tight, people are like, oh, we got to we gotta adopt AI. It's like, no, these are like Nike running shoes. You could buy $3,000 Nike running shoes, but if you're smoking cigarettes and trying to run, it ain't going to work. You got to get your house in order before the technology is really going to be able to do what it can do. So I think in some ways, when we think about easy, fast and unified, yes, Maybe it's easy, fast, unified, and helpful if you got your data tight. Because if you don't have your data tight, it's almost like, remember when like ChatGPT first came out and everyone just like went to it? And what do most people do? Write me a blog post about this. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't, you're gonna get something, but it's not what you want. Now we know like when you're working with an LLM, you have to build the brain, right? Give it your brand in voice tone. Give it any editorial documents that you have. Give it use cases of great writing that that really, um, you know, kind of embody your brand, your tone. Give it your style guide. Give it everything you can and build the brain and give it the data so that now when you say, hey, you know, prompt it well, you are an expert copywriter that specializes in building blog posts for small to medium-sized businesses in the B2B software, you know, business consulting space. Write me an article about this, this, and this for these outcomes with these goals in mind. Now you're going to get gold. And the same is true on the data side of your CRM. If your data's just been sitting in there and there's a lot in there, you got to take the time. My buddy and I, in 2006, we started a nonprofit, okay? 
And we're like two schmucks in Chicago. We're skateboarders. We're like, we, and I was a Chicago public school teacher at the time. And we're like, we're going to start a nonprofit, gather together inner city youth from underserved neighborhoods, and then mentors from like the most innovative companies on the planet, Motorola, Google, Dyson, and we'd pair them up. At any rate, at one point, Colin and I were doing some work. I'm like, oh, this is so boring. And he's like, Mark, we have to weed the garden. And what he meant was, if you want to have a beautiful garden with beautiful flowers and luscious fruits and vegetables and just beautiful garden, you have to prep the soil. You've got to give it the right nutrients. You got to test the pH. You've got to weed the garden. You got to pull the weeds out. And so I think the analogy there is if you are anywhere, and it doesn't have to be HubSpot, it could be anywhere in your business where you've got data, you've got information, you must take the time to pick the weeds out of it to make sure you've got a good fertile soil bed. So when the new stuff comes in and things need to start to grow, it's doing so on solid footing. So I I think that, you know, to our question around data, what is the role of data as we think about the growth of AI and its value to our customers and our clients? It all has to start on good fertile soil. You got to weed the garden, get your data tight. Yeah, I think that's a really good analogy and one that most people can wrap their heads around because we've actually used a similar analogy here, which is pruning. Right. So anybody who's who's into gardening, more specifically, like if you have a rose bushes or whatever it is, even these big, beautiful trees that we have here in the upper Midwest, if you don't prune certain trees or bushes, then they're just going to completely grow out of control, because as long as they have water and sun, uh, they're just going to go out of control and eventually potentially kill themselves or each other. So if you want a bush or a particular tree to be strong, you have to prune it, which is not that different to how some people think about strategy, which is for the less experienced me 10 years ago was strategy is, is about figuring out all the things that you have to do. And that was, of course, half of it. The other half was all the things that you have to stop doing Yeah, to be successful, because you have to stop doing some things that aren't helping you get to where you're going. So you can focus on the things that are going to get you to where you're going, you know, which is similar to weeding and pruning. Yeah. And I think you have to prune the right way. I have, I literally, as you're saying this, I have, I'm not a nature guy, right? But about like six years, we moved into this house and it's got a backyard and there's all this greenery there. I know nothing about this, but I was like, I should probably cut some stuff down, right? Like I should probably, and I didn't prune it in the right way. So it started growing off to the side, all crazy. And I screwed it up. And I feel like this is another place where the value of great partnerships and great solutions partners comes into play. It's like, you can try to figure out your data on your own and you're, you know, what do they say? Uh, everything's a nail if you're a hammer, right? So it's like, yeah, we're just going to clean up data. We're going to start doing this. Yeah, Are you taking care of it? Yes, but are you doing it the right way? This is where the expertise of a partner really comes into play, right? Let's figure out what are we trying to do? What are we trying to not do? What information do we need to get us there? And then let's look at the soil bed. Let's look at what needs to be pruned and make sure we're pruning the right things so that we grow in the right way. Uh, I, you know, when I think of that, I think like, what custom properties do we need? What needs to go away? What things need to be combined? How will all of that is going to help people just be so much better? It's going to help them grow easier. Again, it's like if you don't prep well and you don't think well, it doesn't matter what software you use. It's just going to be more so of an impediment than it is an accelerator to your growth. Yeah, no, absolutely. Which, of course, that whole stream of analogies started with with what you were saying about, you know, being data rich and insight poor. And this is a very common challenge that businesses have where they're like, yeah, we have all the data and we're tracking all of it. But which are the KPIs or OKRs or whatever, whatever it is that you use, whatever metrics you use in your business, which are the ones that are most critical for each individual contributor or each team to know that they're being successful. And you know, obviously in, in marketing, it's a really well-known issue that we're tracking and too much data and, and a lot of it doesn't really mean much otherwise known as vanity metrics. Yeah, I got the lean startup right back there on my bookshelf, of course. That's, there you go. The Bible right there, right? Yeah, but of course it happens in sales too. But ultimately it comes back down to, and this is a big focus in, in EOS, and one of the biggest hidden benefits of, of us having run on EOS for the last 10 years is that so many of our, our clients also run on EOS. Oh, wow. So it, it helps us help them better because when we know that they've just had their annual or quarterly planning, we've actually already scheduled a meeting with them 
or the week or two after that, once they've got all their rocks and everything figured out, and then we sit down with them and say, okay, so how can we support your rocks for the next quarter? And we essentially sort of adapt our program for the, for the next 90 days based on the priorities that they have. So that's been, you know, just back to the side note of EOS, it's been one of the, the big hidden benefits of running on, on an operating system that our clients also use you know, and understand. It's interesting. This I feel like this thread that's pulling through this whole episode is just the idea of like clarity, like laser focused clarity, whether it's on your business goals, your individual and your individual contributors goals, like clarity on who you're trying to serve, what are their challenges, what are your goals, like just having really good clarity around all of it. Because if you're asking good questions, like really good questions, then we can figure out what data do we need to answer that question? And does that support like an overarching goal? Again, like you said, there's a million ways to skin a cat, whether it's OKRs, KPIs, your EOS, your this, your that. The number one thing I think all organizations need to be very clear on is who are you trying to help? How are you trying to help them? And how will you know if you help them well, right? Yeah. yeah. Clarity, just get clear. Cause we, we speak in jargon sometimes. And we, like you said, we use vanity metrics to fill up spreadsheets, but like when you got your three to five numbers, you're trying to hit every month and you know exactly what work you're doing each quarter and each year to drive towards that three, five, 10 year goal, that vision, things get clear. And I think that is one thing I would hope we started the episode saying, what are we still excited about, right? I said, I was really excited that a lot of the, the thoughtful and useful ways that HubSpot was implemented, artificial intelligence, made it easy to use. And I feel like that's a good goal that we have as a company is make our stuff easy to use so we can get quicker time to value. And so, yeah, I'm just kind of hearing this theme of like simplicity, clarity across all aspects of your business. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I actually started a, another great friendship a few months ago, also in Chicago, but we met in Chicago, but he's based down in the area of Florida that was just pretty badly hit, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. And he also, you know, was talking about how Clarity was ultimately, even for them as a business, they actually even changed their name to something related to Clarity, which does make a lot of sense because with Clarity, everything just becomes easier, right? It doesn't matter what role you're in, whether it's marketing, sales, whether you're delivering services, building products, or of course, if you're a prospect, it's easy to know, yep, this is where I belong. This is the right product or, or solution for the problem or the opportunity that I have to solve. You know? Mark, so you do a lot of cool things every week. <laughs> Share with us, like, what are some of the most fun things you get to do on a, on a weekly basis? Oh, man. Well, we have to get better at saying thank you. Thank you. I think I do get to do some cool stuff. I got to like just say thank you. I'm very grateful for it. I always go back to people. So I get to talk and interact with really great people every week. And in doing so, and in service of lots of different types of people. So within HubSpot, right, I get to work with an amazing team at HubSpot Academy. What's really unique about HubSpot Academy is we now, even more so than in the past, uh, because we're really leaning into short form video content, I get to interact with all the teams at HubSpot, product, marketing, people, like everybody to figure out how can we leverage short form learning content to just make people's lives easier. So one thing I'm working on right now is what's called Academy on the Go. And this is a new effort from HubSpot Academy. And rather than, if you think about a spectrum, right? And at one end of the spectrum, you have like very deep expertise and technical knowledge certifications from HubSpot Academy, right? You can go and get uh, certified in, you know, Salesforce for developers, or right, you can get all these different certifications. They take time for us to make. They take time for people and, and knowledge for people to experience and to get credentialed and certified, which it should be. It shouldn't just be an hour and you're certified, right? Like this should show a deep level of expertise. At the other end of the spectrum, we're like, some people don't need that. Some people just are a one to two person show where they're a small and medium sized business and maybe their marketing department is one person, two people. They just want to know what is this thing in HubSpot and how do I do it? And so we created this Academy on the Go framework that has three flavors, I like to say. One is what is. So it's just a, a three minute or less video that just says, what is content remix, right? 
I know I keep going back to Common Remix, but no, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome, it's an it's awesome tool. Cool tool. And then the second flavor is how do I, right? So how do I use Content Remix? And then finally is best practices, right? Best practices for uh, utilizing Content Remix. What we found in early data is like off the charts that one, the format and delivery method of that content is very helpful. It literally People are utilizing it and they're getting right back in their portal and doing the work, which is amazing. We want people to be able to get their work done effectively, quickly, and less cumbersome. And then it's working. The other thing that we found, and this was like kind of as we were starting to, you know, kind of toy around with this idea of short form content, they took a knowledge base article and they looked at the rate of ticket submissions from this knowledge base article. And again, legal disclaimer, I'm just coming up with the numbers here, for example, but let's just say that at the knowledge base article, 70% of the people that visited that knowledge base article, like they would go and submit a service ticket because they didn't understand it. They put like a two minute video in that knowledge base article and within a week, I'm telling you, it went down by like almost like 70%. It was down to like 3%, whatever the initial number was. And so there's something about the way that we consume content. There's something about the way we create content. And I hope everybody really thinks what we talked about, Brendan, about being human-centered, talking in a way that is accessible, breaks through all kind of cultural language, et cetera, barriers, and just get to the meat of the question that people want answered. Mark, was there anything else that you wanted to say still to to wrap up that last your last thoughts on, around the Academy stuff that you're w- working on? So at HubSpot Academy, we've done this Academy on the go. We've seen great results that people are really leveraging the short form video content. There's something special about that content delivery method, the way that we talk and the way that it's just small and bite-sized that's really helping people. And so that's an exciting thing. I also, you, you said, cool things I get to do. You know, I have my own little podcast. That's really fun. I get to talk to all different sorts of people. That show is called Think Differently, a show that explores those who are challenging the status quo and how they do their work and choose to live their life. That's always fun. And then I'm a dad, so I get to do like cool dad stuff. Uh, I'm a husband. And uh, I just try to fill my time with, like we talked about clarity earlier, I'm very clear that I really am, the three things that are on my rubric for that make me do good work are pace of work, creative work, and then time versus productivity valuation. So I need distinct units of time to do really creative work at a fast pace of work. That's what keeps me excited. So I try to fill my days with valuable stuff that helps people, and that's what I do. Okay, that's awesome. Also, I don't know how often you get to talk about your your mom on the show, but the story you told me about your mom was just, um, I, I think about it all the time. I look forward to the opportunity of meeting her one time, you know, when we were in Chicago. Next time, I will guarantee, they are the, my folks are the best. And yes, she is a powerhouse. Yeah, that's cool. Before we go to the sort of the, the final question, I want to make sure we we sort of just revisit sort of the theme question for the show, which is, what we're really digging into on RevOps Champions is why do some businesses scale better than others? And you can look at five companies who, from the outside, all seem to have the same thing. They have the same headcount. They have access to the same technology. They have access to the same funding, if that's what they what they do. However, those five companies are all growing at different paces. There's typically one that's going to be outgrowing all of them, and then a couple that are going to be lagging behind. In your experience, whether it's firsthand or third hand, what do you see as being the secrets to, well, not secrets, but the formula for businesses? It might be a repeat of some of the things you've already, you've already talked about, but why do some businesses grow better than, than others? You hear this on every podcast, but that is a great question and it's framed beautifully, right? Apples to apples, five companies, same on paper. Why does company A scale grows so much faster, provide more value and grow. I think one thing that we talked about is focus and clarity, right? If we have clarity on the people that we can help, the way that we can help them and how we help them and why we help them, right? Go golden circle. If we have clarity on who or why we do what we do, how we do what we do and what we do, that wins. Then if we have focus on the execution of that, focus being defined as these are the people that do these things to garner these results, I think that is always a winning formula. I also think there is a really, really missing piece for a lot of organizations, which is 
they focus on just doing the work and never take the time to step back and look at the bigger picture. And so I think like, again, if you're an EOS organization, your, your weekly L10, your quarterly planning, this is the time when you're, you're just stopping from doing the tactical day-to-day work to look at where are we at on this journey as a company. And I think that if people don't pick their head up once in a while to look around, it's going to be five years. You're going to lose five years of your life. You're going to be stressed. You're going to be not happy. People are going to come and go. But when you look up at the bigger picture, you can start to see what are macro changes that are happening? How on track are we? And then I think another thing, uh, and then I'll summarize it, but I think you got to keep your people happy. Happy doesn't just mean give them coffee and donuts on Friday. It means challenge them. People are happy when they're challenged and they have a level of autonomy to do their work. So I think like, what are the big things that help companies grow? I think one is clarity on their goals, focus on how they're going to execute those goals. I think then we start to talk about always leaning into the people and letting them do the work and having clarity on that, but also picking your head up once in a while to look at the bigger picture. All of that to me is on one side. You got to get that in order and then you figure out, okay, what tech do we need? What tech can help us? What should we be doing and not be doing? But I think like if I could only choose one, I'd say clarity and focus. Yeah, no, yeah, there's no limit. It's That's one of the other things I, I like to make sure that people realize it's we don't live in a binary world where you have to choose one or the other. I have absolutely no problem with people who are both dog and cat people. I don't make them choose. Yeah. You know, another thing real quick, just add in, again, I'm a design thinker by trade, right? I mean, my career makes no sense. I was a inner city public school teacher in Chicago. I, I was a nonprofit founder. I've done like a million different things. And I like that because it gives a really unique perspective. So I love when I see companies that have teams of people that are like, this person was a biologist, but now they're a marketer. And this guy was a youth pastor and now he's our CEO. I love that. Surround yourself with different vantage points, different experiences, because that's where innovation, that's where creativity comes from. That's where we figure out how to solve for a customer in really unique and different ways. So I love, I love those, uh, you know, heterogeneous teams. Yeah. Are you familiar with Dan Sullivan at all? No, but I'm writing his name down right now. He, so he wrote a number of oh! big books in the last few years. Yes. The three <laughs> biggest ones he wrote together with um, Ben Hardy, Benjamin Hardy. So The Gap and the Gain, Who Not How, and then 10x is easier than 2x. And he's also the reason I go to Chicago once a quarter, at least. And he talks about how the 20th century was about management. So just on the people thing for a piece, for a moment. Yeah, yeah. The 20th century was about management, right? And this is all post-industrial revolutions type stuff, right? You just had to manage people because they were desperate for work and they would have done everything, anything to actually just have a job. That fortunately has changed. And the 21st century is the century of coaching, right? So you can no longer survive as a manager to be successful in business, you have to, I mean, if you look around you, you, the most successful businesses, big or small around you, the ones that seem to be thriving, a lot of them have really good coaches as managers. So that's one of the things that I'm constantly working on because I don't, it's not a natural thing for me because I didn't grow up playing like first division sports or anything like that. I mean, I played a lot of sports and I was competitive, but I never had like the first team coach in anything, which is what I, I realized afterwards that, man, the kids that, are, that have those, I'm talking about kids, whether they're 15, 16, 17 in high school or 19, 20, 21 in, in college, the level of coaching that they get compared to the third, fourth and fifth team that I was typically on is very, very different. And the results, the results show, right? Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is because at that level, it's not, so take any sport, right? It's not just the skill. It's not just the rules of the game and the gameplay. And it's not even just the go get itness to do it. At that level, they're talking about mental coaching, mental health. They're talking about nutrition and diet and sleep. They're talking about mindfulness, right? You talk about some of like the best football players, like American football, they'll do like ballet. They'll go surfing. They do all these things to augment themselves. So yeah, by the way, not planned at all. But I feel like when we met, like, again, we talked about this. I was, a, I felt so lucky. And I was like, this is a really special, you're such a special dude. And 
I have been debating working with a coach for myself. Like I have coaches inside of HubSpot and outside. And so I finally, my wife and I talked and I'm, I have a new side up thing I'm working on. And I had this realization where I'm like, everything I've done in my life, all the different stuff, it always gets to about like 70%. When I consulted on my own, I was able to provide for my family, but I wasn't global a success, right? I got to about 70% and that was good enough. And this new thing, I really want it to be, it feels like it's, it could be the one. And I said, I think I need help. I had this moment of realization. I'm like, I can't get this. This can't be a 70%. This has to cross the threshold to 80 to 90%, if not more. And so I reached out to a coach and I talked with this guy, a guy I met years ago, and he's a coach. And this is what he does. He helps people. And we had a cool call. He said, hey, here's the price. Let me know what you think. And then he offered me a discount, which was very helpful. And my wife and I talked and debriefed. And I'm like, I think I'm going to do it. I think I just got to, you know, I got to pull the trigger. You just mentioning that, I'm going to f- email him right as we figure out or end this podcast. I'm going to email him and I'm doing it. So thank you. Thank you for the inspiration. That's awesome. Absolutely. No, that, that is, I mean, we talk about this with our kids are currently 18, 19 and, and 21 so, that, you know, they're at, at a stage where we have to keep repeating these types of things. And we're just sharing stories of like, you know, you look at high performing people in any sphere, whether it's sport or arts or you name it, business, and the top performers all have multiple coaches, right? Yes. Most people are fortunate just to have one coach. But then, of course, there are others who have two or three coaches for different areas of their life because they want to continuously improve. Mark? Thanks so much for joining me today. It was awesome, and I, and I knew it would be. So I'm going to leave you with one question, which is, if you could leave one word, not literally, but sentence, of advice for our listeners who, again, if they're listening or, or watching the show, they're here because they're trying to figure out the question of, like, why did that business grow better than another? Uh, or how can our business grow better? Because if we learn something from someone else, what advice would you have? Oh, man. I call these Tom and Jerry moments, like the old Tom and Jerry cartoon where Tom the cat would have Jerry the mouse cornered and then like the devil version of Tom would pop up on his own shoulder, be like, get him, get him. And then the angel would be like, don't do it. So on one end, I'm thinking more on like the creative, like get creative, think differently, go human centered, go to people. And on the other side, I'm thinking like focus, clarity, goal oriented. Maybe there's an intersection, a medium there. One word of how people will grow, I think it's just gotta be, I think focus. I really do. I think focus in all areas of your business. Focus on who you're trying to serve. Focus on what makes you different than everybody else and what is your unique value. Focus on how and why and what work you do. And then focus on the people that we are privileged enough to lead. Focus on them. And I think when you have focus, if you've got these five pillars of focus, that is a good thing. That is a full plate that is going to give you really good marching orders on how to you know, help people grow. So I would say focus. Awesome. That's a really good one. Mark, thanks again so much. I look forward to chatting again at some point soon. Of course. Thanks so much for having me. Did you enjoy this episode? Find more at RevOpsChampions.com.